1918, Herman Will took Emmy Noefer's theory relating symmetries to conservation principles and used it as a basis for constructing the first theory of quantum gravity. Energy is quantized. Will's problem in 1918 was trying to quantize space and time. Schrodinger in 1922 took Bohr's theory and married it to um, Will's exponential complex equation. The quantization occurs through the real solutions to the complex exponents, EXP, IS, uh, is quantized at a rotation in, on a complex plane. The alpha axis is real, so as that varies around that, cyclically around that um, argon diagram, you get some um, value, periodic values, which are real, and those real numbers are, are that's the quantization. The imaginary uh, components are all um, excluded from the real world. You don't actually have any, any measured quantities or cross-sections or probabilities which are a complex number. So that's how the mathematics produces quantization. It's a very convenient way of doing it. The, the complex exponent actually goes back to Euler, who showed that exp is equals i um, sine uh, s plus uh, cos s. So you have two terms, a complex term i sine s uh, and a, a real term cos s. Uh, so now, cos s is obviously a, a simple wave as a function of s, so it varies between plus and minus one as s varies. So it's interesting that if you were to drop the, the complex term um, you, you could get a, a very simple wave uh, oscillation to explain what's actually going on in some of these situations. Three bits of experimental evidence um, before uh, Will for, for quantization, let's say, were uh, the, Einstein's photoelectric effect, uh, Planck's black body radiation effect, and Neil Bohr's uh, quantization uh, explanation for the uh, Balmus series and other series of spectral lines involving the electrons in an atom. Einstein explained that um, we don't actually see what we are predicted in terms of the uh, line spectrum from, emitted from stars with different masses, which will be predicted if uh, Will's um, metric was correct. So that theory went out of the window, but the mathematics of Will as I say, survived in 1922, Schrodinger applied uh, Will's uh, mathematical argon diagram complex exponent um, analysis to uh, describe how the Bohr atom has discrete energy levels. And in 1926, after de Broglie came up with wave particle duality, Schrodinger recognized that the exponential equation he had done in 1922 could be uh, interpreted in terms of a wave equation. Now, a wave, an exponential equation does actually arrive, uh, derive from a kind of wave equation. In a wave equation, if you have something proportional to its own rate of change, you have a wave equation. And you can get very simply from exp uh, to the power uh, is to a wave equation. Dirac came up with the idea that you need to put relativity, special relativity, into Schrodinger's equation. Schrodinger's problem was that he uh, came up with a, an equation which treats space and time differently. The problem being, in the Hamiltonian, which describes the energy, the actual wave part of Schrodinger's equation is quite uh, undisputed in the first quantization. Schrodinger's equation was made relativistic by Dirac. Dirac's approach to the problem was to change the Hamiltonian into a spinner. The actual uh, matrix of uh, components for the energy of an electron included antimatter. Uh, this is uh, a pretty interesting problem because you have an SU2 matrix which forms the spinner. And Will, initially, in 1929, argued that this showed that there was a hand in this to electrodynamics. 
if you look back to Maxwell's treatise on electricity and magnetism and his papers in 1861, Maxwell was looking into the idea that magnetic fields were propagated through the vacuum by some kind of spinning effect, some kind of angular momentum. And his argument was pretty pictorial, uh, like um, his hero uh, Faraday. Faraday came up with a picture of field lines in electromagnetism, which is something which is pretty important because it's um, quite different to general relativity's description of space-time curvature. Now, both theories are ultimately dealing with predicting forces, um, things like um, accelerations of mass, uh, accelerations of energy particles. Um, the, the problem, however, is that uh, you can describe forces in various ways. You can describe it by a set of diverging field lines, curling field lines, and around a wire carry, carrying a current, an electron current, a single wire carrying an, a flow of electrons in one direction you have an, uh, field lines which curl in one particular direction or at one handedness around that wire and Maxwell in coming up with his electromagnetic theory suggested that, that this is best explained and the simplest explanation would be some kind of spin angular momentum carried through the vacuum by mediating particles Casimir uh, radiation in space. People often say the vacuum is full of virtual particles. Why don't they cause a force when you move into them? You can't have a neutrino that's going at exactly the speed of light. It has to go slightly slower than the speed of light because the neutrino has a slight rest mass. And those are experiments, there are strong experimental evidence that neutrinos do have a slight rest mass. And so uh, there is evidence that, uh, that there's a problem with the standard model in that sense. Uh, the hand in this feature is a standard model have been um, under attack for some time. Um, Will, as I said, in 1929 came up with this theory that um, Dirac's uh, spinner in uh, second quantization, the quantum field theory, uh, explains the, um, it, it produces a hand in this of left and right handed uh, helicity of particles. And this was attacked violently by Wolfgang Pauli, who said it's nonsense. Pauli was apparently not thinking too much or completely unaware of what Maxwell had been up to in suggesting a handedness of particles. What we're basically saying is that there's a revision to the standard model required, whereby electromagnetism is turned into an SU2 theory, and U1 no longer providing the electromagnetic basis in hypercharge is providing mass. It provides mass to the SU2 particles, or at least to the um, left-handed ones. So we're, what we're saying is that both weak and electromagnetic fields are described by SU2. And the role of U1 is not to provide electromagnetic fields uh, per se, it's instead to provide mass. And, it, and it's the weight that it does provide mass to SU2 that breaks the SU2 symmetry into um, electromagnetism on the one hand, which is mediated by uh, massless gauge bosons, um, charged massless gauge boson, and a neutral one, which is related to gravity, the graviton, and the um, mass, uh, massive uh, SU2 gauge bosons, which are the normal weak um, theory. So what we're doing is we're taking the standard model of particle physics, we're leaving SU3 quantum chromodynamics completely intact, we're not affecting that at all. We're not suggesting any modifications to that, we're trying to minimally change the interpretation of the standard model. SU2 continues exactly the same, also provides electromagnetic fields. We're talking about massless SU2 gauge bosons. In that situation, electrically charged gauge bosons have severe restrictions on their transfer. They cannot transfer charge, a net flow of charge. You cannot have a one-way flow of charged massless particles because they'd have infinite self-inductance. The magnetic field effect would stop them moving. But you can have that. If you have an equilibrium, the charges flow in each direction at the same time. The magnetic fields are cancelled and it works. There is one 
thing that's particularly interesting, and that is that the inverse square law appears again. It appears in the electrical laws, for instance. That electricity also exerts the forces inversely as a square of the distance, this time between charges. And one thinks perhaps the inverse square of the distance has some deep significance. Maybe gravity and electricity are different aspects of the same thing, but the thing that is remarkable is the tremendous difference in the strength of the electrical and gravitational laws. People who want to make electricity and gravitation out of the same thing will find that electricity is so much more powerful than gravity that it's hard to believe they could both have the same origin. And that is illustrated on the next slide. The ratio of the gravitational attraction to the electrical repulsion is given by a number with 42 digits. This tremendous number remains a mystery. I must say, to finish uh, about the theory of gravitation, two more things. One is that Einstein had to modify the laws of gravitation in accordance to his principle, with his principles of relativity. The first was, one of the principles was that x cannot occur instantaneously, while Einstein, Newton's theory said that the force was instantaneous. He has to modify Newton's laws. They have very small effects, these modifications. One of them is, all masses fall. Light has energy, and energy is equivalent to mass, so light should fall. And it should mean that light going near the sun is deflected. It is. And also, the force of gravitation is slightly modified in his theory, so that the law is slightly changed, very, very slightly, and it is just the right amount to account for the slight discrepancy that was found in the movement of Mercury. Well, how can this planet out there look what does it do it looks at the sun and it sees how far away it is and it decides to calculate on its internal adding machine the inverse of the square of the distance and that tells it how much to move this is certainly no explanation of the machinery of gravitation so you might want to look further suppose that in the world everywhere there are flying through us at very high speed a lot of particles that come equally in all directions they're just shooting by shooting by shooting by and once in a while hit us in a bombardment but we, are, we and the sun are practically transparent for them, nearly. But some hit, and so it's not completely transparent. And look what would happen. If the sun is here, and the earth is here, then if the sun weren't here, there would be particles bombarding from all sides, giving little impulses by the rattle of these bang, bang, the few that hit, which would put, not shape the earth in any particular direction, because there are many coming from one side or the other, from top to bottom. However, when the sun is here, the particles which are coming in this direction are partly absorbed by the sun because some of them hit the sun and don't go through. Therefore, the number that are coming from this direction toward the earth is less than the number that are coming from the other side because here they have no opposition from no sun there. And it's easy to see after some mental effort that the further the sun is away, the less in proportion of all of the particles are being taken out of the possible directions in which particles can come. So the size appears smaller. And in fact, inversely, is the square of the distance. So there will therefore be an impulse toward the sun on the Earth that's inversely is the square of the distance and is the result of large numbers of very simple operations, you know, just pit one after the other from all directions. And therefore, the strangeness of the mathematical relation will be very much reduced because the fundamental operation is much simpler than calculating the inverse of the square of the distance. This machine does the calculation. These particles bounce. Only trouble with it is that it doesn't work for other reasons. Every theory that you make up has to be again analyzed against all the possible consequences and to see if it predicts anything else. And this predicts something else. If the Earth is moving this way, more particles will hit it from the front than from the back. If you're running in the rain, more rain hits you from the, from the front of the face than in the back of the head, because you're running into the rain. And so as the Earth is moving in this direction, it's running into the particles, rather, and running away from the ones that are chasing it from behind, so that more particles hit it from the front than from the back, and there would be a force also sideways whenever there was any motion. This sideways force would slow the Earth up in the orbit, and certainly would not have lasted the at least three you know, four billion years that it has been going around the sun. So that's the end of that theory. Well, you say that was a good one, though. It got rid of the mathematics for a while. Maybe, maybe I can invent a better one. And maybe you can, because nobody knows the ultimate. But to, up to today,